Hello everyone and welcome to the Media Education Lab. We are here for a special webinar, our second last webinar in the Inequalities in Media Education series. And we're joined by three wonderful speakers uh, who are talking about conspiracy drum roll, please. <laughs> so uh, the topic is what conspiracy media education in and the mirror world. And they will be talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and how that has led to um, a lot of scrambles around between the real world, virtual world, between communication, common sense, between people supporting vaccines, opposing vaccines, misinformation, disinformation. It's going to be really interesting. We're also going to be talking about, and this is the best part, small scale, but big data analysis and sociocultural commentary and complications of public discourse. So I'm really, really excited about this. And um, our speakers today are Michael Hexman, who is a professor in the Faculty of Education at Aiken University. Um, he's already done a lot of amazing work in this area. Two of his recent books include uh, the co-edited volume Education for Democracy, 2.0, Changing Training for Senior Literacy, and another created volume, which is the Handbook of Media Education Research, in which I also have a chapter. <laughs> uh, our second speaker is uh, Patrick Marin, uh, who received her bachelor's degree in computer science at the Valor Institute of Technology in Ten, India. And she's also interested in data science and social justice, particularly in the social determinants of health. And uh, I think you all met uh, Michael and Parvati during a research fellowship that she had at Lakewood University. And a third speaker for today is Miranda McKee, uh, who's currently pursuing her PhD in Communication and Culture at York. And her research examines the power of photography as a form of public pedagogy with specific interest in visual and information. Um, and with that, over to you. Super, thanks so much, um, Davina, for the nice introduction. And um, hello to everybody. Um, and a special hello to the two co-presenters that I'm working with, both of whom uh, we've had some involvement um, as you know, either a research associate from afar, which is Bargavi, we've never met in person. It's always been online. Um, she was uh, officially a research fellow at Lakehead University, but at a, at a particular time when travel wasn't possible. And um, and then uh, Miranda and Bargavi and I have all worked on a project together at a certain point, um, but again, in, in that particular way. And Miranda's uh, passed through Lakehead and now is a doctoral student at York University. But um, yes, well, I guess today we're talking about conspiracy, we're talking about media education as well to some extent and uh, maybe the impossibility of uh, media education or the difficulties, the the challenges, shall we say, right, um, that we face today. So we'll start um, right in. And um, yeah, it, it, this will, there's uh, an anchor in, in a circumstance in Canada, which was a, um, a, I'm having a hard time clicking along here. Here we go. Uh, which was the um, occupation of Ottawa um, in the winter of uh, 2022. And, and um, Bargavi's uh, specialization and, and the terrific work she's done with us is in the data mining and, and data uh, analysis and then data visualization. And, and that's to that we're clearly indebted in relation to this project. But I want to start off a little bit around, you know, how, how do we consider media education in this moment? And I want to start off by, by you know, suggesting we stay to our lane, right? Like, which is that we, we, we have something, an engagement with media. So now we're dealing with, you know, well, media representations, media technologies, and media institutions, right? These are the sort of the, the prime ground of media education through the, the eras. Um, and so when we look at conspiracy 
and then also I, I insist that we also talk, you know, at least register populism. We're, we're actually talking about um, sort of formations, cultural and social that, that we don't, can't really control from a media education perspective. This, and, and I would like to suggest that conspiracy theories operate on a register that's closer to what would be oral culture, that these are stories and narratives that in fact, this is not the first era in humankind where there's been conspiracies. We, we all understand and agree on that, I believe. And then that, that there are political forces. And in fact, that none of this happens with sort of an invisible, we might have an invisible agent, but we don't have a, you know, a non-agent. There is always political forces engaging in, in this, you know, what are really campaigns of disinformation, et cetera. Um, and then how conspiracies form is something that, that emerges from that. But um, as I was uh, preparing and thinking, okay, well, this is a media education gathering and you know, how do I start to think about this with folks? I, I wanted to just remind us of, of some of the older paradigms. And you know, here we have the one, two, three of um, production text and readings. Um, but this is the, the model, which I always prefer, which is Richard Johnson's What is Cultural Studies Anyway, which has this foresight lived culture. And, um, and I just want to suggest, well, maybe that we have a turbocharged audience today. You know, that, that when we're talking about uh, an active audience that was a television viewing, couch sitting audience, it's a very different audience than one that, that inhabits media in a particular way, where, you know, on a daily basis, we're actually living in an environment and we, we actually act, actively engage with that. Um, so the old paradigms don't really work, but I still wanted to suggest that at the simplest level, you know, some of what's happening here where there's disagreements about is this conspiracy or not is, is you know, we can actually reduce to this question of readings, you know, did you take the dominant reading or did you take, you know, a negotiated or oppositional one? Um, and I and I always like to point out as well, Umberto Eco's ideal idea of an aberrant reading, like I didn't understand, you know, I didn't get it. And, and I think there's a fair amount of aberrant readings that sort of get assimilated today into, you know, this is the way it is. Um, and then that bottom, that bottom node, you know, the lived culture. I, I want to say, well, that's actually now very generative. And in in, in in Johnson's model, you know, we have a circle going back. I mean, an arrow going back up into production, right? So let's say that 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 now that we live in the media, and the media is sort of part of us, um, that you know, we're engaging now at minimum, you know, as agents when we recirculate, right? Like so, we or when we remix, when we you know, we change and and you know, we develop our own meme or whatever, and we put it back into circulation, but but simply just recirculating what's out there. And we know that, you know, we can't get into deep depth of, uh, of this right now, but we know that there's a, a willingness to recirculate stuff that comes from trusted sources in, in our own imagination, you know, and just fire that off without really examining it. And uh, I'm liking this term digital wildfires, which is, you know, someone I'm just coming into contact with, but, you know, this idea that, in fact, when something big happens, a sort of media event, then people get involved and they start firing off um, these recirculations, et cetera. And then also in that lived culture and that lived spaces is, is the other things, you know, the other stuff that's going on. In fact, you know, we could put here the climate crisis. I mean, we could put here, uh, you know, a, a difficult economy. We could say that the price of milk is going up and Bill Gates doesn't know how much it costs. I saw that on the Ellen show the other day. I mean, we, we, have much more going on than just what you know we can simply you know sort of um, uh, ascribe to the media. So we, things are a wee bit complicated, right? Let's say now while we were doing our research, um, so was Naomi Klein doing hers for her new book, and um, this then came out last uh, September 2023, and um, it's helped inform I think a little bit or it confirmed certain things and it, 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 it added others, right? Um, Naomi's work is, fit, you know, is, is very thorough and, um, and she's a good thinker, she's a good theorist and <clears throat> she helps uh, in those manners, right? So, so she talks about living in a, in a world where there's a reflection, there's sort of like, let's call them lanes again, you know, I'm living in this lane, you're living in that lane. But she also points out the shadow lands. There's this other world that that is ignored. Those are the you know the, those the, the world of precarity, 
the place where people are doing the work that others take for granted, the, a place where people are suffering because of the actions of others elsewhere, right? So, so it keeps things quite real, and I, I really respect that over. But then this idea that we're doppelgangers, like the datafied self is that self that's registered external to us, right? So um, the social medias, the et cetera, is they, they have a register of each of us. And that register is a multiple register. Like, in fact, there's probably, you know, 35 Michaels or a thousand Michaels out there. I don't know, but at minimum, there's one more. It's not me. And then there's the idealized one. It's the one I create when I go on social media. So then there's three of me at least, at least, right? Uh, and then she has this other doppelganger who's somebody who, you know, mimics or, you know, connect. Well, people confuse her with Naomi Wolf. But some lovely, you know, she's a good with language. She talks about this being a hallucinatory period, and that makes a nice connection to AI, um, that there's a whole lot of mangled concepts, and one of those is body integrity and, you know, my body, myself, and all that stuff, and how that got taken up and turned into an anti-vax uh, slogan. She refers to us being all on a digital magic carpet ride. Um, but more importantly, she says about this conspiracy stuff, like, ignore it at our peril. You know, just do, this is actually something that's very important that that it not be scoffed at. And actually, I said below here, don't mock it. You know, there's this thing that she would hear from her friends. Wait till they hear about cell phones. Like um, she points out that, in fact, there are reasons for people to be concerned. And there are reasons for people to believe that there might be a bigger conspiracy. And, um, and that some of this is born out of half truth, et cetera. She also refers to some political movements um, and something called diagonalism, you know, where where folks that are saying now I don't describe to, um, to labels anymore. I'm sort of a bit of both. I, you know, I, I'm just concerned, right? And that, that sort of thing. And that's where she sees the anti-vax and the anti-woke folks coming together. I mean, where we're trying to go in this talk is one of our concerns about is, is how alternative health, alternative culture, people um, were drawn into the anti-vax movement and the odd bedfellows that we see. So what Naomi Klein says about the far out becoming the far right. And uh, and she does point out, and this is relation, related to populism, that there's a, a need on the part of, you know, a particular po political movement in the United States to draw in women, and so mothers. And, and that a lot of this aligns with some of the interests of, of a political party in the US. Now, um, we are in this time of, um, Naomi Klein calls it conspiracy smoothies. Um, there's multiple conspiracies out there. This is a little word cloud I made. I'm not going to go into it. Um, for matters of time, I think the, the central mythical uh, conspiracy theory is the one about the Great Reset. And uh, that uh, centers around Davos. It centers around this man, Klaus Schwab, who wrote a book called The, the Great Reset or co-wrote it. Uh, he said it's time to move to a kinder, gentler capitalism uh, that's stakeholder-centered, not shareholder-centered. So that's his Great Reset. The Great Reset got picked up as something entirely other um, in the conspiracy world. And this idea that you will own nothing and you will be happy that somehow or other there's forces out there that will take over, you know, and they will put us into this. Um, uh, indentured labor, and we will live in open air prisons, which are now euphemistically called 15 minute cities. So, interestingly enough, this conspiracy has been aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And the idea of this, the way that this conspiracy theory plays out, is that by 2030, all this will take place. So, if, if folks don't uh, recognize the writing on the wall, then this big trouble is coming, right? And um, but also complicating matters is that that often you see some interchangeability. And I, I made this image here, you know, where the vaccine mandates and this Hollywood cabal, which is the QAnon cabal. And then, you know, very troubling that the critical race theory and the LGBTQ I, I, I2S that got movement gets seen as somehow connected in some manner, never really directly and clearly, to all these other areas of concerns and somehow socialism, elites, and any form of social welfare will somehow be proof that you're, you're, you're trying to point in those directions. And uh, 
I just took this uh, quote from a, a newspaper comments section, but uh, I, I loved it. You know, in the wokey world, information is disinformation and disinformation is information. So essentially that is something that we might say, right? So this is not like, this is a free agent now. This is a world where, you know, each is pointing a finger and that's why the mirror is such like, you're doing disinformation. No, you're doing disinformation. And off it goes in the various directions here. Um, I'm, uh, okay, yeah. So, and then you will have heard of the red pill and the idea that um, some folks are awake, they're, they're becoming aware. And I did find that interesting how that sort of lines up with Paulo Freire's conscientization. So it's a, it's a different version of it coming from a different, um, uh, a different perspective, right? So the, there's this sort of free trade in ideas now where the lines have, have totally you know, become muddied. And in the mix, and again, as our interest about the new ages, et cetera, some uh, powerful influencers like JP Sears, Russell Brand, are now peddling this idea that the Great Reset is upon us. Um, I also took a, an image of a demonstration which is, uh, had a lot of women engaged um, as, as some more evidence of what we're concerned about. So moving into Ottawa, and I, I know my time is running short, so I'll be uh, handing off the baton to Bargavi in a second. But we, the Great Reset was very central to this gathering of truckers. The truckers occupied the main city of, of Ottawa. They occupied the street in front of the House of Parliament. They occupied the streets behind that. Um, I mean, you know, directly around that. It was a, you know, a major um, impact on that city. Um, there's images that it, it took place in other parts of the country. There was some elements of it, and, and the media really hung on on this that were, you know, far right. Um, but there was also a broader mix, and this is an interesting side of it, and what we might call the daytime and nighttime of Ottawa. That uh, that it, at one moment it's it, it involves certain people, a sort of celebratory vibe, etc., and another, you know, the people organizing it might be a little bit more. Um, uh, dedicated to their to the right wing cause of um, trans. I mean, essentially, there was a desire to overthrow the government. They're asking Justin Trudeau to step aside, and there's a lot of the what I'd call the mum and pa component as well. There's this caravan went across the country, and people came out to to it, etc. And so it became very, you know, much a, a common interest thing. You know, people uh, tired of the uh, mandates, you know, getting engaged in it and. Bhargavi, I'm about to hand the baton, but I, I have these, I have a good collection of memes from Ottawa and I, I can't help but share them because I think, you know, when we're looking at the, the visuals that, that, that sort of push people to certain viewpoints, um, it's really important to see the terrific creativity behind the scenes, right? I, I'm not going to actually explain each one of these, I'd love to, but um, I think you'll you'll all get something from someone, but this is just Trudeau, and then this uh, this desire to sort of uh, make Justin Trudeau a, a, a coward, a weakling, and and sort of feminine, feminine or childlike is also part of a, a particular uh, approach to what this all meant. But um, Bargavi, I'm going to hand it to you. Hello, uh, hi everyone. Um, all right, so the data analysis part of this project began with scraping Twitter before its recent ownership changes. Uh, there is an API um, that allows us, allows researchers to gain access to a larger number of tweets than the average person can. So um, how it works is we use keywords and th uh, any tweet that has those keywords or those hashtags in it, uh, is automatically collected and put into a database. So to begin with, we added a set of seed uh, keywords as I like to call them. Um, they're listed here, wax, wax, uh, with two X's, sheeple, all these um, really obvious sort of uh, dog whistles that people use. And um, we collected tweets with them and then analyzed the tweets that we collected to find common patterns, common words um, that, keep, that kept coming up. These words then became keywords themselves. And um, we had a list of 46 keywords and hashtags that were uh, extracted and we used those 
we ran the scrape for using those uh, to collect our entire database. After the database itself was collected, uh, we went through, um, here's the list of hashtags, thank you, professor, uh, and keywords that we used. Um, if you'll, uh, the ones highlighted are the um, seed keywords that I added manually. All of these were um, limited uh, by time to the period between March 2021 and July 2022 because we wanted to sort of zoom in on the convoy. But um, on a larger scale, uh, movements are uh, radicalization, slip and slides uh, like these can be seen across the world, especially uh, I think intensifying would be the right word here during the pandemic. Uh, this is a snapshot of our final uh, C database. After we collected all the tweets, we used a uh, really uh, primitive, I want to say natural language processing tools, um, not anything uh, intimidating really. Uh, we've had those tools go through them to find common patterns, uh, like these sentiments listed here. Uh, the sentiments were decided manually, I decided then the machine did not. And then I sort of parsed the data with the machine uh, with the algorithm to find tweets that corresponded to these. Uh, so for example, outrage might be anything that uh, tried to get people to react in even in a negative way to what the tweet was saying. Tweets like these, um, for example, they were characterized, uh, characterized by um, hinting at racism, for example, um, calling the coronavirus um, an uh, Asian uh, influence, or uh, I'm, I cannot give you the uh, quote right now, but uh, things like that, racism, uh, attributing it to the LGBTQ community, things just to, that just wanted to get a reaction. Um, as we go through the slides, uh, I, we have a slide about quotes, if I'm not mistaken, and you can see how all of these uh, labels really uh, sort of overlap. Like you, you can have uh, tweets exhibit multiple of these characteristics. Um, after uh, so after sort of annot uh, annotating this data, we built a map. Uh, here you can see the overlap I was talking about. For example, the movement uh, area of this map uh, refers to tweets that were attempting to mobilize the anti-vaxxer community. Things like um, they're firing military officers for not getting vaccinated. We need to push back this, you know, uh, they were likening it to a genocide. They were likening it to the Holocaust. It was these are things that uh, attempt to paint the anti-vax community as another, um, as they are um, an other that is being oppressed by society, so they would have to band together. It also overlaps heavily with mistrust uh, for obvious reasons. They do not trust those in power, which is why they feel the need to organize within themselves, these tweeters. Um, it also overlaps with outrage because... Uh, well, I, I don't know that there's a way you can compare something with a genocide or the Holocaust without intending for it to be outrageous, right? Um, uh, like And again, like you see, there's a lot of uh, trickier, I want to say, uh, areas of this map. For example, choice here is really tricky because uh, my body, my choice is a sentiment that um, people on both sides of the narrative would tend to agree with. Uh, and... The fact that that sentiment is being repurposed to fit this narrative is what makes it really tricky because um, at that point, when you read those tweets, you might find yourself agreeing with them. Uh, you might find yourself saying, yeah, people should have bodily autonomy. They should be allowed to decide what goes into them. But it slowly devolves into a movement, uh, which devolves into outrage, which devolves into... And before you know it, you will find yourself on the other side of the political spectrum from where you started. Uh, uh, I think this might be the most um, devious part of the map even. Um, another way people who aren't on that, who wouldn't agree with any of these tweeters, other tweets, for example, find their way into this side of the spectrum is through alternative uh, health routes, I want to say. So if you are someone who has an interest in alternative uh, therapeutic mediums, like homeopathy, for example, it could be really easy for you to be led astray by, just by... Uh, experts who are spotting other uh, uh, modalities of treatment for COVID. Uh, they could start off saying, you know, drink this and you'll it will help you sleep better. And it slowly devolves into this is a cure for COVID and the government is hiding it from you. Or vaccines are going to do this from you. And if you pay me, I can, I can you know, detox you of these uh, vaccines. Um, so here you see the overlap with pseudoscience and ego, where it says natural immunity is the best. And I'm a trucker who hasn't gotten a single dose of the vaccine. This is where it overlaps with the anecdote 
uh, part of things, uh, stuff like this didn't happen to me, so there is no way it could have happened to anyone else. Um, so this is an excellent example because it it has multiple it has multiple uh, layers of overlap to it. You can really see uh, how these people find their way into the network. Another one here is it has to do with medical mistrust, um, which again is a legitimate issue, just like the choice argument. But you, you it is a really slippery slope where people can find themselves starting with well I'm not sure a hospital you know is doing everything right to doctors are evil and we should never approach them ever. Um, this is a simplified map, I want to say. This is more political, really. So um, on this side, you have people who do like vaccines. And on this side, they have uh, absolute anti-vaxxers. So um, over here, you see uh, how people sort of cross over. Um, over here, you have, in the bolded words, you see the choice argument where you think no one uh, should have the power to force anyone into anything. And that slowly merges into there is something to be said about natural immunity over vaccines and then it goes to you know they create poisons and they're trying to depopulate the world um these are these uh this uber driver one uh, especially i remember it having a lot of uh retweets in the uh uh, uh in the database so this one is an anecdotal one where uh some point um uh, uh, made up an incident where a uh, Uber driver tells them that uh, they felt like there was a gun to their head to vaccinate themselves, which uh, again, it covers outrage, it covers the ego, it, co um, it, it, it is a wonderful example, really. And uh, you can also see the play of religion in here where they sort of bring up the mark of the beast. There's also another angle where it goes, God gave us natural immunity and, you know, getting the vaccine could be an insult to God. Um, so it's, um, uh, it's a really, uh, it's, it has multiple heads where it, you, it can, you know, get people, you know, if you're a religious person who is otherwise neutral about vaccines, that could be what sets you over the, that could be what sends you over the edge and gets you involved in the network. These are some of the major themes that were identified from there. Uh, so as you go to the center, you get, um, uh, towards the extreme of the map, I want to say. So on the outer regions, you have religion. Not all religious people are anti-vaxxers. And then slowly, as you get to the middle, you have this sentiment that is, um, I like to call it a point of no return on the larger map, uh, where once you have someone thinking that they are being persecuted for their beliefs, there is no logical argument that you can make against that, that they are likely to believe because they will, they are of the mindset that you are another. Right? And this is, again, another um, point of no return where uh, they start to regard people with differing viewpoints as normies who have been brainwashed by uh, the government, by big pharma, by the doctors, what have you. Um, so at, at these uh, points of no return, they there is absolutely no logical argument to make because these positions are not something that that people logic themselves into. Um, so uh, these major themes can be better rep uh, seen represented on this map, where the ones with the uh, red outline, as you can see, are the points of no return, and the ones with the green outlines are gateways. Gateways are how people who were not part of this particular agenda to begin with find themselves coming here. Um, we liken this to a game of snakes and ladders, uh, where um, just by trawling Twitter, you find yourself bitten by a snake and sort of slip into the whole um, radicalization map. Uh, so one of those gateways could be over here, um, what is in these vaccines, right? Which is, uh, it is a natural question. It is a completely valid question. But when you look to social media for answers, you find... You find things that are that would otherwise be absolutely unbelievable, right? You have uh, pseudoscientific papers, even papers that are that resemble actual peer-reviewed papers. And to someone who is not in the academic space, they can be extremely believable. They they read those papers and they think, oh, if experts are saying that, maybe I should look into this more. And they follow those hashtags and they find themselves led into chemicals are so bad. You should never use any chemicals ever. And that sort of gets into the whole natural immunity space, uh, which goes into use this to detox, all the snake oil salesmen come into play. And um, once you get into that uh, place, you land at the normies won't get it because I'm smart and they are not. 
which also plays into the ego angle of the map. Uh, another important gateway, I think, is my leader says, and on top of on top right of the map, you also have my pastor says, um, which again, any religion really, you have uh, political leaders and you have religious leaders. These people, it does not matter what the cause is really, it does not have to be anti-vaccination. Um, any cause, they are very likely to slip into it just because they're leaders. Um, so that really devolves into what they are trying to silence our voices, they are lying to us, and this is a threat to my freedom. Uh, this particular, yeah, I don't think that was, uh, this particular, uh, my, this is my threat, this is a threat to my freedom. This place can also be arrived at from the choice uh, point of view where you're like, yeah, I mean, I got the vaccine, but I don't know that everyone should. And suddenly, you know, people are being forced to, and you start viewing people who speak for vaccination as a threat to your freedom. Um, I think one uh, big thing that all areas of this map have in common um, is the susceptibility to um, media, uh, media trends, for example, uh, is a susceptibility to look at a hashtag and follow it. Uh, right, because if you if you weren't the type to see a hashtag called the pandemic and sort of look into it, you would not. There is no way you would be dragged into this whole thing. Um, there is a very interesting research paper that addresses it. It talks about um inoculating people to radicalization. It is not in the context of this paper at all, but um, I think it can be applied here in that if you show someone um uh articles or even you know natural language tweets addressing uh why this is wrong or debunking these tweets and then they see those tweets they are less likely to believe um such narratives because they've already been debunked in their head yes i think i've covered all my points if anyone has any questions or if i left anything blank i will have at it after miranda and the professor Anna. Brilliant. So you're going to share screen number, Ella, right? Yes. Just getting that going. Okay. Um, so thank you, uh, Bargavi, for uh, going through all of that fascinating research for us. And thank you also to Michael for setting all this up and uh, Davina for, for hosting us. It's wonderful to share this space with you. Um, so my name is Miranda. Uh, I will be presenting, uh, sharing a little bit of my visual research uh, for this project. Um, so I did a small investigation into the conspirituality continuum, in particular by looking at female presenting influencers in North America. Um, so I, I research um, visual material, and uh, for this particular study, I identified 10 different cases, in particular on Instagram, uh, of, as I said, uh, female presenting influencers that seem to be engaging in this um, conspirituality world, this world where conspiracy theorists and people seeking um, spirituality sort of uh, community uh, come together on uh, online. So I identified uh, 10 case studies and they had between 5,000 and, and over 500,000 followers. So they ranged in terms of how many people uh, followed them. Um, and once identified, I went through each account and I selected uh, 40 of the most recent images that the influencer had posted, um, skipping over the videos so that at least I had sort of an apples to apples um, corpus of 400 images to look at. Um, so I, uh, as common with uh, common practice with social semiotic visual analysis, um, I began with a content analysis of that whole corpus and started to pull out the, the themes that would emerge and then did a closer reading on some of the images of interest. Um, so 20 themes in total emerged that, um, that were, you know, in some cases really obvious. So for example, lots of selfies, perhaps no shock there in the influencer world, you know, 54 out of the 400, um, 60 images of food or cooking, 15 of home farming. These are just stock images to get you an idea of, you know, what we were seeing, um, 22 images of child rearing, homeschooling, that kind of thing. Um, so while these are really obvious themes that emerge um, that I think you would yourselves be able to identify as well, um, right off the hop, there's some that are a little 
little more nuance that began to emerge um, as we looked at the images more carefully. Um, so for example, anti-vax was obviously one that we were tracking, uh, 28 instances of anti-vax in these images alone. Uh, that was across six different accounts. So it wasn't you know 28 images just in one account, but across six different influencers. Uh, lots of references of the idea to of manifesting, you know, this problematic notion that you, if you simply believe in something, uh, it will come true for you, which of course completely ignores issues of race and class and gender, which also um, play a role in, in whether things sort of come true in your life. Uh, 12 instances of nostalgia, uh, which is something that, you know, we've noticed in previous research uh, in, in different communities. Grafton Tanner speaks at length about the dangers of nostalgia, this problem um, that arises from suggesting that the past was some utopia, which completely ignores, again, you know, inequality and abuses of power that mark our past. Um, so another theme that we noticed that emerged from this corpus uh, was conspiracy pride. So 27 different instances of this kind of rhetoric, uh, which seems to adhere to conspiracy theories and really celebrate that. So I have a couple uh, of examples. Um, so, you know, memes, as, as we've seen already uh, in, in Michael's presentation, are uh, of compelling interest in terms of visual data. Uh, Lamore Schiffman writes about them in her book titled Memes in Digital Culture, and she writes that rather than being uh, a single cultural unit that's copied and pasted and forwarded across the digital world, she suggests that a... Um, a meme is a group of digital items sharing common characteristics of, you know, content or form or stance. Uh, and two, that these items are created with an awareness of one another. There's a relationship between these different items. Uh, and also, you know, they acknowledge one another in that way. And they, uh, what I found to be important is they are circulated uh, by, you know, they're imitating one another, they're transformed by many users. It's this remix element that I think is quite interesting. And, and the two examples that, uh, that I'm showing here uh, will give you a bit of an idea of what I mean. So these are two examples from the corpus, one from case study six, one from case study four, they're anonymized. Um, and the, the narrative is the same. So the, the sort of joke here is I meet someone, we talk, I explain that the elites are trying to kill us, they leave, start again with a new person. And it, they're uh, in a way laughing at themselves because they're struggling with, you know, uh, adhering to conspiracy theories, talking about them, and then, um, you know, losing friends. <laughs> so there's a difference though, obviously, in these two examples. You know, on the left, we see that the person has added the word satanic to describe the elites. And they've also included this fiery creature in the center, which perhaps represents um, a satanic elite, I'm not quite sure. Whereas on the right, it's a totally different image of a you know, 1940s style um, gentleman uh, who is laughing perhaps at this whole idea. Um, so this brings me, you know, to this idea that Schiffman also makes in the books that memes are not simply just funny little videos or images um, that, you know, get shared a bunch of times. They're, they're remixed, they're disseminated. Um, and she also influences, or she also emphasizes that they shouldn't be underestimated in terms of their relevance as cultural items. Um, so coming back to this idea of conspiracy, pride, what does it mean when a group of people are proud of their conspiracy theories, even if people are disagreeing, even if evidence uh, to the contrary continues to build? Um, so another couple examples of memes of conspiracy pride. Um, this is how I sleep at night, knowing all my conspiracy theories are true. Uh, when you realize you're not talking to one of your friends who sees your posts and you sound kind of crazy. So there's there's really an acknowledgement here uh, that you're you're sort of burning bridges, you're you're losing followers. Um, another case study said, don't try to win over the haters, you're not a jackass whisperer. So there's this sentiment that they're they're proud of their conspiracy theories, even though um, they're they're losing uh, people, uh, whether in reality or or online. So when I was looking at the 10 case studies as a whole, this is sort of the data set. 
um, what seemed to emerge was that the cases that had the most um, consistent posts of extreme viewpoints also tended to be the ones that didn't have as strong a following, um, so smaller, smaller following groups. And so there is a hypothesis that emerges here. Um, uh, you know, an Instagram feed that incorporates conspiracy theories in a subtle manner, rather than allowing them to really dominate the overall sentiment, they might be more likely to maintain and, and continue to grow their following rather than alienating themselves um, from some of the people that are following them. So um, learning from what other people are, are speaking about uh, in the discourse, uh, Beres, Remsky, and, and Walker recently published a book on conspirituality where they express concern that the, the distance between the morbid cruelty of QAnon and the pastel anxieties of conspirituality is only a matter of degree and defined by social acceptability. So I thought that was interesting when thinking about this. Also, um, Gell and Lawson, who write about mass social engineering, uh, in particular, for example, about the methods used by Cambridge Analytica uh, in influencing the 2016 election. Um, they point to a tactic called bullshitting, uh, a, a true indifferent mix of friendliness, deception, and accuracy, which seems to ring true here. Um, so perhaps there is a, a necessity to have a balance in expressing extreme viewpoints with some fluffy content uh, to to secure a larger following and to maintain that following um, without alienation. So um, so how did the more extreme content emerge? When we saw it, what did it look like? What did it sound like? And and where was it coming from? Uh, so this was interesting to note that uh, many of the posts, for example, that pushed an anti-LGBTQS2I plus or an um, Black uh, anti-Black Lives Matter rhetoric or anti-abortion rhetoric were also combined uh, in particular with the promotion of a, a business. And one retailer in particular um, continued to emerge. So 47 images out of the entire corpus of 400 posted by not one, but four different influencers in this group, um, equally two, Amer two from the United States, two from Canada, uh, were promoting this one retailer. Uh, which is described itself as patriot owned um, and is associated with this idea of anti-woke. Um, and so here are two examples where we see the image that was on the, the, fir the first image that you see uh, on the post, uh, often followed by many, many other images, up to eight uh, in, in one example. Uh, and they, they start with this sort of accusatory, uh, are you funding this satanic agenda? Are you supporting the corrupt, walk, um, the, the corrupt woke agenda? Uh, which, you know, is meant to sort of bring their audience members in to say, well, are you? I don't know. Maybe I need to keep swiping to find out if I, if I am. So the imagery points a finger in that way. Uh, and then it, it continues to uh, post about pointing the finger at um, large corporations uh, that, you know, do indeed have many concerns. Uh, but in this case, their, their concerns are about um, anti-LGBT sentiments. So they're pointing the finger at them for, for showing, um, you know, rainbow clothing and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so, for example, what's noticeable in the data was that out of the 40 images in the whole corpus that expressed anti-LGBTQ2S sentiments, 30 of these were promoting the business. So there's a correlation here and thinking more about that, um, you know, necessity to balance the manure with flowers, one could hypothesize that, you know, while the sentiments were already perhaps had by the influencers, was the, the opportunity to make an additional income that pushed them to actually say, well, I'm going to post about this today. And I don't usually, because I don't want to alienate too much of my following, but in this case, I'm going to make a little bit of money so it's worthwhile. So questions that still need answers, but um, these are these are the sort of the trends that we found emerging from the corpus of, of 400 images. So I will, uh, I will leave it at that and, and hopefully we can uh, take a few questions, have a little bit of discussion and, and thank you again to all of you for, for sharing this space with us today. Michael, do you quickly want to wrap up for us? Bring it all together. I, 
Yeah, I mean, I have the slides that I plan to, but we, we're so short on time. But, you know, I, I, I do want to just say again that, um, that you know, this would, should redouble our efforts. Like, that there's a way where when I first started thinking about conspiracy theories, I thought we, you know, media, this shows the impossibility of media education. Um, but on the other hand, with that comment I made at the beginning of keeping in our lane and recognizing that, you know, media education can inform about media and representation and, and how, you know, truth is, is told or how it's shared, how ideas are shared, how perspectives are shared, that that's the work that uh, continues to be ahead for us. Um, and that the conspiracy world is, is maybe an object that's a little too big for, for media education, but our understandings are, are, you know, improved. Like I think that some of what I heard my colleagues speaking about today, it certainly helped me and it's helping me. We're, we're writing a paper. So I think I, I, I enjoyed today. I think this really helped for us anyway, and I hope it helped for some of the audience as well. Oh, yes, absolutely. We already have comments in, in chat uh, that, that are thanking the three of you and uh, saying that this presentation was great. So thank you so much. This is the time when people could either use the chat or raise your hand. Uh, yes, Scott, you had a question or a comment. If you could unmute yourself, also join us on video if that's possible. Yes, sorry, I was just, uh, I'm on a new device and it was asking me for permissions. Um, so I am finding myself in a strange place. I'm in Arizona where I'm spending time with my mom and um, the conspiracy theory is a multi-generational thing here. It's really kind of interesting to me to find out. I have friends who are, you know, college educated, one of them has a doctorate in like Chilean protest music. And he's like, I'm a conspiracy theorist. So it's like, tell me more about that. And there is an, there was in fact a, a radio show here in Arizona about conspiracy theories going back to like the sixties or seventies. So I think one of the things I'm wondering about, like do, I'm wondering if the panelists have any thoughts about when do you find yourself in these places of this is actually somebody doing what they heard their mom and dad doing and, or, um, you know, the other thing that I, I hear sometimes I've had people, I said to this one friend who was espousing conspiracy theories, where's this mistrust come from? And she very quickly said, oh, it's from when, my, you know, my dad beat me mercilessly when I was a child. And so I tend to not trust authority figures. How can we lean into the sort of educator side of media educator to understand the interpersonal dynamics that we're having to think through with stuff like that, I guess? Did somebody did somebody say that this audience asks tough questions? I mean, uh, that's to some extent. I think you've enriched just our you know conversation by by sharing what you've shared. Um, I think me personally that you know we maybe have space to provide one insight in a in a situation you know in a conversational situation over a dinner table where someone's espousing what's clearly conspiracy theories and you have to find your one insight the one thing that you can get really comfortable explaining with some sense of authority that you can get behind it like i think the fact that this klaus schwab wrote a book called the great reset you say yeah yeah he wrote a book called the great reset yeah and in fact he's trying to you know justify the ongoing you know the um Capitalist, you know, keeping capitalism rolling by finding a kinder, gentler version of it. So it's stakeholders, not shareholders. And that that's the one I rest on. But um, I, I think it otherwise, you know, it's too too wide ranging. And these um, there's always some half truth that you're going to be fighting against. And I remember hearing David Frum speak once and he said, um, Doc, what do I need? And the doctor put you know put the vaccine in his in his arm and he said the people i know who are anti-vaxxers they know exactly what's going in there like they they have a, a a complex understanding of of actually what's what this vaccine you know it, 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 it contains and and i don't so we are often in a situation where, where we're lacking in knowledge compared to the person that has the conspiratorial views the QAnon stuff and the and the the you know the, the man running into the pizza place with his gun, and you know being uh, that that person has was arrested, and and later said, "Well, wait a minute, I was really fooled." You know, that's another example of one where you can say, "Well, what about that one?" But I don't know. I, I appreciate the 
our question, Gus. And next question for one of you, Bargavi or Miranda. Um, Barbara, you had a question. Yes, I was going to <clears throat> kind of make a, a common question. So I developed a workshop to teach adults to decode the news, to give them skills where they can become empowered to figure out, is this factual? Is this not factual? Using a, a sift, which is a technique in lateral reading to explore. I guess from my perspective, and especially what's going on in the US, the more tools people have to explore what they're reading, hopefully they will take a different tact. And our media has been deregulated since the traditional media since 1996 by the Telecommunications Act. So you have six mega corporations that own 90% of the commercial media. What do they care about really giving the facts to people? So this is a comment, but you can give me some input. I appreciate it. I think we should keep it as a comment, uh, Barbara. It's very helpful, and uh, that we will we'll hear more voices. Appreciate that, Miranda. You had a response to that specifically. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a really difficult challenge. I I um just wanted to throw back to something that Bargavi mentioned about the inoculation theory and and just the practice of of looking at what. Um, has been identified as fake news to to become more accustomed to the um, sort of strategies that are used. We know that you know affect is sometimes a spreading factor in in um, what circulates online and isn't really truthful. Uh, but it is it is an incredibly difficult challenge, uh, particularly given the the form of media today. Well, Michael already um, mentioned that this is the top room. Sorry, Harry, go ahead. Um, no, if I could um, restate the inoculation theory, I think uh, workshops along the line of what Barbara's doing could really be helpful uh, in that regard as well. I think especially um, uh, targeted at teenagers, uh, people, um, children of the age uh, where, you know, it's the first time on social media, they, they're not really sure what is real and what isn't. I think workshops or even schools with classes uh, about media literacy aimed at that stage could be helpful. But then again, there's also um, something we should consider about do kids really want to hear this from their teachers, uh, which again, I, I'm not sure there's an answer to that, really. Yeah, yeah. Kristen, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, um, it actually piggybacks on both Barbara and what Bhargavi said. Um, I find myself at a community college and um, teaching media literacy and teaching communication skills. And part of my um, history has been debunking myths and teaching them to sift through information, what is legitimate information, what is not legitimate information. And I find them somewhat resentful, um, not all of course, but resentful that you're telling them something different than what social media has told them. Mm -hmm. And um, trying to navigate the way the, your way through to in, in open their minds or widen their scope, and telling them, I'm not trying to change your mind, simply help you to discover other views or other avenues um, for investigating um, what is presumed to be fact. Um, it's it's very challenging and I any insight, I would be welcome <laughs> to glean. I'm, I find I'm getting better at it. Um, but it is really a, a very large obstacle at the 18 to 25 year old age. And at the same time, having older adults returning to school with larger worldviews and a greater scope um, of exposure. And there, there are major clashes um, and mediation skills come into play, right? I thought just sifting through and teaching the rules of, not the rules, but um, logical application of the sifting theory. Thank you, Barbara. I might adopt that. Um, any insight? I think to add insight, could I ask Pamela to come off mute 
and maybe on video, if you can talk about what you mentioned in chat, mm. role of community at the technology. Yes. Um, yeah, so I was a couple of years, so I don't have the article citations at hand, but I live in a really divided community. So it's mostly very, very far right MAGA. And part of it is that you want to fit in with that community. Um, your neighbors believe this. You're going to believe what your neighbors believe. And this is part of the reason why people don't want to change their opinions in some ways, because this is how they all feel. And if you say something different, you're breaking from your community. And I live in a rural community, so it's it's growing mm -hmm. really fast and it's changing really fast. And those sort of conservative, quite frankly, MAGA communities are becoming stronger because of change, right? We're changing the way the community looks. We're changing the economy of the community. And because they have been there and they talk a lot about having been there forever, like this is our community and now it's changing. It's not the way it used to be for us. They sort of double down on some of their beliefs because it's who they were. And I, some of it is fear, <laughs> but also some of it is community pressure, right? If you go against this, your neighbors are gonna say, oh, you're joining the Dems. <laughs> you, you like someone else. <laughs> and they'll feel like they're ostracized. <laughs> And so that's part of sort of a general statement on the um, community epistemologies, but the people you're around sort of create how you understand the world. Okay, I'm gonna ask Michael to really respond to that quickly in the interim. Yeah, just, I just feel a little frustrated in the media education, the media information literacies, the, digital literacies, et cetera, that were of, of, about the term disinformation. And I feel that sometimes disinformation, um, it sort of becomes empty of agency. And it's just this problem that we have. Today, we have to deal with disinformation. And the reality is that today we have to deal with, with this complex political and social um, circumstances, which are, you know, where, where there's active attempts to to change the way people think and to reprogram our society and uh, and hearing you know hearing Barbara hearing Kristen like hearing all of you speak, um, I just see that you know I feel the um, imperative the you know the circumstance that we're in and and the desperate need to do what we do but my goodness it's with such difficulty you know that that wall that Kristen uh, describes it's a it's a tough wall. And I almost feel like we need allies. We need like pop stars. We need Taylor Swift to start working on the disinformation file. Like we need somebody other than us. <laughs> but I don't know. It's such an interesting conversation. I wish we could carry forward. Agreed, agreed. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. I'm so sorry, Bob Ryan, you could raise your hand. But um, also there's a very, very uh, lively chat that we have going on, which has some brilliant ideas and insights as well. Uh, I'm going to share the chat with uh, the speakers, Michael Miranda Bhatri. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your work with us today. Um, I've also shared in uh, the chat links to events that are happening at the Media Education Lab over the next few weeks. Uh, far as the inequality in media education webinar series is concerned, this was the second last webinar. The last webinar is happening on the 18th of April. It's on post-colonial media studies, which is very interesting. And as Barbara noted in the chat, uh, our next media club is kind of the opposite of what we spoke about today. It's about optimism. Uh, and that's happening on the 1st of April, 2024. And it's not an April Fool's joke. It's actually happening on the 1st of April. So please join us. And thank you so much for attending and participating so actively today. Thank you. Thanks, Davina. It's always terrific, I have to say. I don't know. Anyway, thanks to everybody who, who um, I can't think of the word I want, who contributed the three, the three um, voices. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>